philosophy, I think it's just useful to have a bit more of the scientific background. So, um, I will give you a general introduction to life from the biological view. I will tell you what are genes and how can they be edited, then why are they edited. I will give you some examples that are just common examples. I um, choose them so they would not be too ethically discussable. And then um, maybe you have already heard about crystal cas because it's big on the news, um, at least in the scientific news. That's why the focus on this especially. So what are we made of? The smallest uh, unit matter is made of uh, atoms. And these atoms then are grouped into molecules. <laughs> Thank you. So a molecule is simply a group of two or more atoms held together by chemical bonds. And if it comes to living beings, we talk about biomolecules, which are the <laughs> molecules that are present in living organisms. There are four major groups of um, biomolecules. We have the carbohydrates <laughs> over there, um, known as sugars normally. They are built from um, different monosaccharides, <coughs> which can be glucose, ribose, something like this. And these monomers, which is basically a building block for the polymers. Um, so these monomers are then put together to form molecules such <coughs> as stark or glycogen. And those polymers then can be found in different compartments of the cell, for example, granules and chloroplast, chloroplasts or other structures. We also have the lipids or fats over here. They are built from fatty acids and the polymer that they form can be, for example, triglycerides. So fats are normally found in the cell membranes or in special fat cells. But this lecture will focus more on um, Nucleic acids and proteins. So nucleic acids are DNA, RNA. Um, they are made from nucleotides. There are four different nucleotides. Um, exactly. Adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, which are abbreviated with the letters A, C, T, G. If you have ever seen a representation of the genetic code, it's always with these four letters. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the DNA, for example, can be found in chromosomes. And the DNA also is the code that tells the cell how to synthesize proteins, which are made from different amino acids. There are 21 different amino acids <coughs> that can build the polypeptides or proteins, which then are found in really lots of different structures. This is, for example, the intermediate filaments, which is some structure that keeps the cells stable. So we have basically two different types of cells. The prokaryote cell, which is um, bacteria, so this is simplified. Um, and the eukaryotic cell that has a nucleus, which is the main difference over there. Um, the eukaryotic cells can be found in animals, plants, for me. No. <laughs> um, so in the cells we have the, the lipids, mostly in the cell membranes. Um, the carbohydrates or sugars, they are somewhere in the cytoplasm normally, which is the empty space um, that you can see. The nucleic acid uh, for the bacteria is simply in the cytoplasm, so more loosely um, in, the inner, in the inner part of the cell and for eukaryotic cells they are in the nucleus. And the proteins are really form part of many of these structures so um, you will also find them in the membrane, you will find them in the different organelles at the mitochondrion or the peroxisome which all works with proteins basically. So now. The central dogma of biology is this um, the transcription and the translation. So I told you that the DNA is the code for the proteins. And this works in two basic steps. So we have the DNA, 
over there, which is then transcribed to an RNA, which is, um, yeah, I will go into more detail on the next slide, but it's a single stranded sort of message. So this RNA is also called messenger RNA, and um, this RNA is then used for the translation by the ribosomes, and this is how the protein production works. So you can see that in eukaryotes it's a bit more difficult because we have the DNA in the nucleus, but the translation, so the production of the proteins takes um, place in the cytoplasm. So we have the RNA and it's processed and exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm in order to produce the proteins. So this Sorry, is can I ask? yes. Sure. What do you mean, central dogma? It's it's the main a, subject of molecular biology. Okay, because we can. <laughs> okay, dogma. I mean, strange word. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's it's a big term, I think. Oh. So this is small uh, in detail. The transcription. You can see that you have the the DNA which is more stable than the RNA due to its um, biological structure. Continue, <laughs> <laughs> um, So we have the RNA polymerase, which just moves along this um, double-stranded DNA, unwinds it, and facilitates by this movement the production of the single-stranded RNA which is then in the next step used for the translation, <coughs> where we can see that we have the RNA, which also consists of these nucleotides. And we have the, um, we have always three letters that form one colon, so three letters of this genetic code tell the ribosome, in this case, and which, which um, amino acid it needs to put in into this growing polypeptide chain. chain. So um, the ribosome basically moves along and looks which of the tRNAs, which stands for transfer tRNAs, is the appropriate one. The tRNA then connects to the... Um, yeah, so they find each other because the tRNA has an anticolor that fits perfectly to the colon. And then the ribosome catalyzes the transfer of the amino acid to the polypeptide. So the ribosome moves along the mRNA and the protein just appears or is fabricated by this process. So to sum it up, we have the, yeah, we have the central dogma of biology that DNA is transcribed to RNA and then translated to protein. Um, I know this was a bit scientific, but is it more or less clear what is happening? Yes? Okay, if you have any questions, just, <coughs> just interrupt me, it doesn't matter. So the question is, what is a gene? A gene is a region of um, DNA that is made up of nucleotides, and it's the molecular <coughs> code of heredity, that's the official definition. So basically, a gene is a part of DNA that produces an RNA. This RNA can be biologically active, like mRNA that's used for protein production, or one of the tRNAs that's used for the um, transfer of amino acids. And this picture is um, the composition of the genome of um, SYN 3.0. So this is an attempt to find the minimal bacterial genome. And you can see that most of the genes are, in fact, um, used for the expression of genome information. So for this transcription and translation process, <coughs> the rest of the genes um, are used for the establishment of the cell membrane or the cytosolic metabolism. But there are also 70% of the genes that are just unassigned. So we don't really know what's their function. So where can we find genes? I already told you where to find the nucleic acids. So for bacteria, it's in the cytoplasm. 
and for eukaryotic cells it's in the nucleus but it's also in the mitochondria and in plants also in the chloroplast. So if we call something gene food instead of GMO food, uh, which stands for genetically modified uh, food, it's not correct because <coughs> whenever we have a meal we take about 150,000 kilometers of um, DNA. This is what we eat with the meal. <coughs> so every food is gene food. So how can genes be edited? Mm, we can edit them randomly. For example, this is what a gene gun does. I also have a YouTube video. Let's see if it works. It's for showing you that it's not as spectacular as you might think. Because you just have this chamber, and you have the cells in the petri dish that you want to modify. You build a, a pressure, a vacuum, and then what happens here is that you just shoot gold nanoparticles, so really small particles of gold that are coated with DNA into the cells. And this works, so... <laughs> So you will afterwards find some cells that actually express the gene that you brought into them. <coughs> That's the whole process. So this is how you can modify genes. What you see, like this thing that fell down, it's, um, it's just a filter, so just a small nanoparticle can pass through and modify this. Okay. Um, so, but... Yes, you can also just inject DNA into a new, newly fertilized egg, for example, of farm animals, maybe also humans if you want to. Oh, do you want to share? No, I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but random is not as reproducible, of course, and not as efficient as it would be if we could specifically modify genes. So we have some specific methods that all rely on something that's to a molecular scissor. I will talk about it in more detail in, on the next slide. And what they all do is to break one or two uh, strands of the DNA, and then natural repair mechanisms are exploited because um, it's better to visualize them, I also have short YouTube videos for them. So we have the non-homologous end joining, which can be used to create a knockout, so a deletion of, the, of some gene or some basis of the genetic code. So we have the double strand of DNA with the different regions. And if something, for example, our enzyme comes and breaks the double strand, this is what happens. The strand is just degenerated a bit. And some different proteins donate some of the proteins, but some of the proteins come. Cut again a bit of the DNA strand so that we have to, um, it's called a blunt end. So this is a blunt end when you don't have any single base track. And it's just like it back together again. So we see we have a deletion of some region. We don't have this part C of the original sequence anymore. So 
So this, um, this mechanism can be exploited for gene editing. This mechanism can be exploited for gene editing if um, we just want to delete a gene, not if we want to bring in any additional gene. If we want to insert a new gene so that a new protein can be expressed or something else, we have to use the homology directed repair, which is based on a template. Um, you will see it now. So you have the sequence that you want to change, and you have the strand that's the same DNA, completely the same DNA. So what scientists do is to use a strand um, where, which has the same sequences on the sides and the region that you want to insert in the middle. Yeah, so he said that these overhangs can be hundreds of base pairs long. So now we have in this um, in this purple sequence a gene that's not in the original sequence. It will still be um, replicated by this protein, and this is how we can bring in a new gene. So in this case, we restore the original strand. As I already told you, we can bring in the original sequence if we want to. So, but in order to exploit these two mechanisms that I just showed you, we need a break in one or both strands of the uh, um, DNA, and this can be done with the so-called molecular scissors, which can be made from DNA, RNA, or proteins. The proteins that were most famous for this were the zinc nucleases or the transcription activator like <coughs> effector nucleases, so-called talons. And what they do is to find a specific sequence in the DNA, which is normally palindromic, and just cut it. So, but how can genes be edited in a whole organism? I just told you that DNA is present in every cell of our body. So, but we do not need to modify all cells of our body. For example, if we have some brain disease, maybe just the cells that are related to our brain need to express a certain protein. So we can always target a special structure. Um, there are different ways of doing this. We can use viruses to modify cells. Um, so this is if the organism is already grown up in a grown-up, we could use the virus to modify some of the cells. 
Um, this can also be done by simply taking some cells of your immune system from your blood, modifying them and putting them back into your organism. Or you can also tie it as with um, DNA mm -hmm. polymer complexes, so for example DNA that's somehow coated with lipids or something and can be administered just like a normal drug. And um, of course you can also do germline editing, so you can just modify your organism that has created few cells, so an embryo or something else. So why do we edit genes? If we think back again, this DNA is transcribed to RNA, is translated to protein, we can see that we can edit a gene with the aim to obtain some certain protein, which is frequently done. We could also produce some sort of RNA, of course. Um, then, not so common uh, applications that repair changes in the DNA. Um, and if we just want to do research. So in biology, we often see this gene that we ask ourselves, hmm, what is this for? And then we just knock it out. So we just, yeah, it's like that. So we just delete it and check, OK, so now the mice can't walk anymore. So it has something to do with the nervous system, something like this. So um, now to a few examples of biotechnology in the everyday life. So for example, in washing powder, we just take an organism and modify it genetically. Normally it's bacteria. Then we um, make the bacteria produce this enzyme and purify it. So we will just have um, the pure enzyme and the rest of the dead bacteria, which could be some more toxic or whatever. Um, an enzyme is basically a biological catalyst, which just means that you can that you have to use less energy for the same process. In this case, it means we can wash our clothes at 30 degrees instead of 60, and we'll still remove the same stains. <coughs> so you can see this um, this washing powder contains lipase and protease. Ace always means okay, there's some enzyme involved, and it will degrade something. So in this case, lipids, fats, and um, degraded and proteins are degraded. So this is uh, widely accepted. I've never heard of any demonstrations against washing powder. The question is why. Um, we can discuss this later on. I think it's because the companies are not really promoting that they are using biotechnology um, because they might be afraid of the image and also because the organisms that are modified for this are normally just bacteria or yeast, so nothing too exciting. Another example would be insulin. Insulin is a peptide hormone that's used for treating diabetes. It's a rather small protein, which just contains 51 amino acids. And earlier it was extracted from pigs, which means we just could obtain small quantities. The quality always varies if you extract something from the nature. Um, and the people that were using it constantly had to inject a foreign substance into their body, which can lead to chronic inflammation or human responses. So we started to use this little fellow, which is the pet of all molecular biologists, Escherichia coli, um, which is a gut bacteria. We can modify it genetically. It's it's really selfish for that, so um, it's easy to modify it. You can just do it by heating up the bacteria, adding in some DNA, cooling them down again, and it's fine. So um, in addition, this is able to produce the insulin that has the human conformation, so it's no longer recognized as a foreign substance by the human body, and it's sustainable and reliable. Another example would be the human growth hormone, which is used to treat growth disorders, but also for doping and bodybuilding. Mm. Um, it's made from 191 amino acids, and it was earlier extracted from the pituitary glands of human cells, <coughs> um, which has an, yes, which leads to an increased risk of. Uh, Contagiation with Jakob Kreuzfeld disease, which is the human form of the um, um, mad cow disease. 
but nowadays all of this can be produced by recombinant DNA technologies. So now I will come to um, CRISPR-Cas, just because it's famous. So what is CRISPR-Cas? CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and CAS simply stands for CRISPR Associated. So this abbreviation is um, long and unhandy, but it's just a description of this genetic sequence. Because we have repeats <coughs> in the sequence, which are short and they are palindromic, and they um, repeat themselves in regular distances and are interspaced by some other sequences. So this is the name of the sequence, but actually the thing we should focus on in this are not the repeats, but the things in between the repeats, which is parts of DNA from plasmids or bacterial bugs. So this, what we're looking at now, is the natural immune system of um, bacteria. Because when the bacteria are infected for the first time with some plasmid or some bacterial part, <coughs> just like you can be infected by a flu or something, they will um, take a, um, a small portion of the DNA and just put it into, like, store it um, in this CRISPR sequence. And upon the second infection, um, they can again transcribe this CRISPR um, locus and use this to degrade the RNA, uh, the DNA of the invader. So how does it work? This is um, this is a picture from my bachelor thesis. So I work with this system actually. And when you want to modify genes, you always have some <coughs> sequence in mind that you want to target, which is called a target sequence. So what you need for CRISPR-Cas is just um, a protein, the Cas9 ligase, for example, and a guide RNA, which tells the Cas9 ligase where to cut. So this guide RNA tells, OK, this is the target sequence. Cut here. And experimentally, it, um, it's really easy to get this round thing over there, which is a plasmid. It's just a circular part of DNA, and it already codes for the protein. So all that you have to do when you're in the lab and you want to do this is to produce this guide RNA that's specific for your target sequence. And that's also not a problem for a molecular biologist, because you can just buy the short sequences. You bring them into the plasmid, bring the plasmid into the cell, and there you go. You can genetically modify basically any sequence in any organism. So what's special about CRISPR-Cas? It cannot be detected, so if you use other techniques, you normally have some scars, or some special sequence where you can say, ah, okay, I think something was cut here. It's easier and cheaper. You can buy a do-it-yourself kit like this one, just for $150. And it's, as I just said, it's applicable to any sequence in almost any organism so far. <coughs> and it's the first um, efficient uh, approach to the creation of gene drives. So gene drives are simply techniques that promote the inheritance of a um, particular gene. Um, so they promote to increase its prevalence in the population. So, for example, when you have two copies of the gene and you modify one copy um, in CRISPR-Cas, the, um, the special characteristic is that this one modified copy can also itself modify the other copy. So that you have two modified um, copies and, of course, the both of your copies are modified. Also, your children will be modified with this. Uh, one approach for this are mosquitoes. So, because they transmit malaria, lots of um, people are working on how to reduce this. And there are different approaches. For example, you could reduce the population by producing infertile females, 
or you could just breed resistant, mosqu resistant mosquitoes that um, yeah that are resistant to the parasite on the mosquitoes that actually transmit the, mala the malaria. So um, we can see that this would lead to a reversible change of the ecosystem, which is um, definitely among one of the severe security issues that we have with CRISPR-Cas. But there are other ones, so <coughs> you could have off-target mutations because we have the target sequence and CRISPR-Cas is already really good in just modifying the mechanism at this one sequence. But nevertheless, sometimes it says, ah, oh, this sequence looks similar, maybe I'll cut here also, which is of course not what we want and people are working on reducing that. But still, it can lead to severe problems and illnesses. It's really cheap and easy, as I just told you, which is good for researchers in countries that maybe not have the economic resources for so much research, but it can also facilitate a lot of biohacking. So you can just um, work in your garage and do some experiments, modify some organisms, modify yourself. This is quite popular in um, the US, but yeah, I mean, weapons can be generated by this, or it could lead to some un uncontrolled release of GMOs, genetic effect. Right. So if you want to read further on this, the basic books where you will also find all the information um, that I told you about are the Campbell Biology book, which is impressive. Um, and also the so-called PERS, which is nowadays written by Sadhana et al. And also focuses on basic biology. If you need just some words, you can always check Wikipedia. The articles are normally of a good quality nowadays. And for a more um, easier and funnier approach, I can recommend you the books of Reinhard Wellenberg, for example, Biotechnology in Cartoons or Who Cloned My Cat. And there are also plenty of um, online platforms to learn about genetics. So thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, let me know. What do you mean they add themselves? I mean how easy is it to do this? Um, did I understand you correctly? You said they added themselves in the US. <laughs> no? um, yes, yes, there are some experiments. Um, I know, for example, that people would inject some protein into their eyes in order to increase their, their night vision. Oh. Things like that. So I don't know how easy it is, but I know that it's quite dangerous. So please don't do it in your eyes. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> you could learn it for just $150. Yes. Um, can you please explain uh, palindromic sequences? I'm not sure what that means. Ah, okay. Um, it's. Can we go back to the front slide with the molecular symbols? <laughs> Exactly. Um, it's just this. So if you read it from, from here to here and from there to there, it's the same sequence. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all this. We in Serbia have this sentence, Anna Volim Milo. Uh huh. Okay. Let you solve this. Ah, all right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let me uh, try to make, them, make sure. So, uh, the in, in uh, CRISPR Cas9, the uh, the uh, entity that cuts is the, the RNA is the guide. Am I correct? And the entity that cuts is the protein, or mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And how does the protein get the information what to cut? Um, they are connected, so it's a it's a complex maybe. Um, if you can see it on that slide. Yeah. 
on that one. No, that. So um, the guide RNA just sticks to the DNA where it's supposed to be cut. And because the protein is associated to the RNA, the protein is also fixed on that specific um, sequence of DNA. So the RNA copies, uh, brings information to the protein, and then guides the protein to that place to cut it. Is that correct? Are you sure I understand it correctly? Because I, I was in uh, uh, at the, at the gene editing conference a few days ago, so this this was something that puzzled me. And I asked, it, I asked the biologist to explain it to me, and they were not able to uh, do that probably because they didn't understand it. So I'm not accusing them, but this I do understand. So how I repeat this is correct. Okay. Thank you. So you don't have to go to uh, the world conference for this, just be <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listen to what's the line you learn. Or use internet. <laughs> so the other one is the uh, comments, criticism, wishes. <laughs> we we'll talk about in the next lectures. Nothing. Have you done this book? Yes. So uh, can you send us uh, this presentation so I can move over it once more before the last? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, we will send all the presentations to okay. where your mail addresses, so that will be done. So what do you think? Why is no one complaining about enzymes in washing powder? The profit is <laughs> more important than <laughs> People probably don't know that they're in it. Because I didn't know until you told us. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. So the aim was also to show you that biology is or biotechnology and gene editing is already integrated in everyday life in various applications and also with benefits. Does it affect us direct? I mean, those ingredients in the washing powder? I mean, sorry, I don't know anything about biology. So, uh, does it affect our skin maybe or something like that? I don't think so. So, I mean, what you would use if it's not an enzyme, you would use other chemical compounds which can maybe be more damaging to your skin. So, yeah. why do you think someone should complain about them? <laughs> 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 because it's cheap editing. No, the interesting thing, which of course we will discuss in uh, terms of the seminars also, that it always comes to the application where people complain. Mm -hmm. For example, if it's in medicine, everyone, uh, for, like, if you use gene editing to produce some, some medicine, normally no one complains. But if you use it to modify some food or whatever, there are lots of people that complain. So that was also what I wanted to show you with this. And this uh, washing powder is part of the, what you call white biotechnology, industrial biotechnology. And basically, it's either not known or unproblematic that it exists. Because you don't really get um, into touch with the biotechnology. So what you asked about the enzymes, you could also um, get these enzymes probably by other ways, like extracting them from some plants or whatever, but it would just use more resources and would be more expensive probably. So, um, uh, the, because most people here are uh, ethicists, I suppose, who are the fruits? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so, the good, uh, uh, or uh, gene editing. So, uh, if uh, if you can cure 
diseases like that. So diseases that uh, affect concrete humans, uh, certain rare diseases, or uh, uh, some forms of cancer, uh, some other diseases, and the transmission of rare diseases, for instance, that's obviously a, a, a good effect uh, of gene editing. So on the bad side are safety issues in the sense of uh, uh, gene drives uh, of, uh, of uh, unwanted characteristics. So that's one thing. And the other is enhancement, whether that's typically ethical question, whether to use it for therapy only, or do we have the moral right to use it for enhancement? I can't give a tentative answer to the second question. I think we do have this moral right because there is no, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons is that there is no clear border between therapy and enhancement. And of course you have to look at it in a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on what the trade you're going to enhance. But in principle, uh, uh, there, is, there is nothing, in my opinion, wrong by using gene editing for enhancement. So basically, it comes down, so the, the negative aspects of it, they, they come down to either safety issues, which can be improved. We first have to be sure what they are. So they're mostly safety issues and pretty much that. So the rest is not so morally doubtful. What it seems to me. Poor, poor and rich people. Okay, yeah. that's a good point. Uh, yeah, but uh, here, but th that applies to everything. So, poor people, some poor people cannot make a living. Some poor people don't have clean water to drink. Some poor people don't have enough yeah, to eat. They die and so on. And some people can buy anything in the world. But that's so. That's a, a, an actually a problem that is not connected to the use of biotechnology. It's a, it's a problem it's on a gen more general level. We can make a superior race. Yeah, okay, that's and another that's problem. Uh, but uh, gene editing is cheap, so actually the equality issue there is not so, uh, n not, not so prominent as in some other things. So I think uh, uh, equality is more important for, uh, for the issue of uh, uh, whether some people can cure very simple diseases for them and their children, and in some parts of the world they cannot. But here, in this case, that's not the primary problem. The other problem is, is, is what you mentioned. So that that's, that's a discussion concerning enhancement and, uh, and therapy, and there is no clear borderline. <coughs> so you have to know which type of enhancement we're talking about, this one thing, and how safe it is. But the other arguments against gene editing, I don't think, are that strong. These are strong arguments. I mean, you're not to exclude it, it's supposed to, but to take it into account. care about the enhancements, I think we should be very careful with that because uh, who knows where it would lead, you know. We have to we don't have enough information to do enhancements right now. We have to know more, you know. So people should be very careful with that. Where would it end? You know? It's like an auto evolution or something. Yes, what if uh, we start uh, enhancing ourselves? Uh, part of the population, and uh, some people refuse to do so. So, most of may, maybe a person that doesn't want to enhance himself, he can't work in uh, like like he can't be a sportsman anymore because all, all sportsmen are enhanced. You know, well, this is an apocalyptic scenario, but uh, it makes a point. Because uh, if, uh, if uh, I think that we, if we allow enhancing of humans, that's what I'm talking about, we should um, make some ground rules. Uh, on what purposes are we enhancing ourselves and so on? Because if we do enhance ourselves and some people don't want to do that, they will, uh, they will fall on social certification. Mm -hmm. It's like with education, you can go to college, but you don't have to go to college. So you study biology or philosophy or whatever, but you could have decided 
to, uh, to uh, be without uh, uh, university education and to perform some, uh, some more simple work than the work you're likely going to perform in your life. So you could have decided not to enhance yourself by education. So why uh, do you think that your decision to enhance yourself by education should not be uh, uh, should not get a gratification for you. So why shouldn't you be rewarded for your education? But nobody Which is, is afraid of education, but he's afraid of education. Okay, but exactly. in, the 19th century, in the 19th century people were afraid of, uh, of the trains because the argument was we should not introduce trains because Trains run faster than people, and that's blasphemous. Bobo. Yeah, but it's a one-way road. If we start enhancing ourselves, it won't stop. That's you know? science. We have already, uh, <coughs> humanity has already achieved uh, the possibility to annihilate itself completely. So in, in the in the fifties already, so to deplete the whole globe. And even that couldn't have been stopped, which is obviously that's an apocalyptic scenario. <laughs> so, but we had that and still have that. But we have it already for half a century, the possibility to destroy the planet. Is uh, and this is a new work. I mean, it, but it can, it's a it's a it's a weapon that can also cure diseases. So that's the point I'm trying to make. So to have in every concrete case in mind and. If it can serve enhancement, I don't uh, know what the, whether there is a strong argument if it is safe not to do it. Because if it's safe, why not treat it like any enhancement, like even the most traditional enhancement, like education? And what is more dangerous, this or a, a lunatic on the nuclear uh, button? Be it in the US or Russia or whatever. What, what, is, what is more that? I think the latter is more dangerous to have an unreliable, unreliable person who is in charge of uh, nuclear uh, facilities, uh, weapons in, uh, in the country. Yeah, but we can get rid of weapons uh, with, if we start hacking our DNA, you know, we can get rid of that. But why do you think so? Because it's $150. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can do it. Okay, but uh, to be fair, the modification of humans would be more difficult. <laughs> so injection of proteins or something like that is easy. Um, but for example, to modify a child before it's born, that needs a lot of more resources and more training. And experiments. experiments. High culture, everything, basically. More money. I could get your very, very like uh, um, subtle modifying of genes. Excuse me, sir. Um, if you want to modify in the future, yeah. hypothetical, uh, hypothetical, uh, hypothetical, hypothetical, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, genes of the human in embryo, it, um, like specific. Uh, it will cost more money. If you want to do it in your garage, yes. Yes, and in general too, because you need the eggs for the experiments. Uh, Everything. Yes. It has been done, so there have been... Some yes, in China. Yes. Yes, yes I heard. Yeah, because um, they have a different philosophy and many things. So. They are often more open to this sort of technologies <coughs> and not like we say, okay, let's just check if it's safe. <laughs> they are like, let's do this. <laughs> yes. They have more people. <laughs> more. more resources. And the value, of, the value of life in China is quite low. Like, it, uh, but your, your Ursula's point was, I think that we already have it. This gene editing, uh, you, you, you get the example of this washing powder. So, so we are already uh, we have all the dangers already. So there is uh, there is no no specific danger in applying it to humans. So, including for the purposes of um, of enhancement, there is no um, yeah.
And the so other lower is talking issue. about uh, a bit more radical changes. No, more radical. It's yeah. still not at the future. Yeah. It's yeah. not started yet. Yeah. Maybe it will. You, you do have the possibility, for instance, uh, okay, you, uh, even if you don't apply it to humans, take, for instance, the, the, the mosquito example. So you gene edit mosquitoes so they cannot transmit the dengue fever or, or, or uh, another disease. So you think you're fine. But then, then they crossbreed, because they say crossbreed with existing species. And then you get something dangerous, for instance. So that, it's already da danger. It, it can be dangerous even if you don't apply it, uh, apply it to humans. Uh, but the enhancement therapy, uh, apart from the fact that it's not a clear cut uh, distinction, we have also the other element that we are already applying all kinds of enhancements to us. So uh, <coughs> cosmetic surgery is obviously an enhancement. So as uh, someone who, um, who goes to cosmetic surgery requires more, uh, a more beautiful woman is frequently more powerful because of her looks than a woman who is less beautiful. So can, she can use that, for his, or men, for instance, uh, instead of uh, being bold, they can use, I don't know how these things, but they, they can uh, use but means to not, be not to be bold. They can be or stronger. But that's okay, but that's the why they get education. And you have more power because you're not bold, <laughs> more power because you're liver, then uh, uh, the use of Viagra as an enhancer, you know, the same thing. So it, it's, it's all, 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 all kinds of enhancers. Because uh, when you're talking about gene editing, there is a lot more, lot, a lot of more questions mm -hmm. like ethics, like culture, like religion, we can uh, we can't talk about gene editing uh, without uh, questions. Like okay, this. but go to Strachin Shabana Street. You have it. Everything you mentioned, culture. You have uh, the, uh, all, 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 all the issues you mentioned. I God, re religion. Oh, oh. Oh, so you can, you can make make a religious argument. That, um, uh, that cosmetic surgery, uh, like it is performed on uh, on this um, uh, this example of Sakin uh, Chabana Street, right? So Silicon Scadolina, so that you all arguments apply. So you have advancement, you have a religious issue, you have an issue. All the issues are already there. So there is a. Sorry, I'm not from Rome. It's one that gets it. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, 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 cosmetic surgery designed to enhance the uh, okay, extent of your lips you or your breasts. Okay. That is that, that's the symbol of Strachin uh, uh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's why I gave it. So it's already an enhancement with all the issues you 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 mentioned you mentioned there. So you you have it. You have. Uh, aesthetic enhancements you have, which my power you have, sexual enhancements, sexual enhancements uh, Viagra, you have uh, the traditional enhanced for education. So yes, all but when you work on somehow superficial level like this, but the questions that were would be raised about religion and culture and uh, how they affect the acceptance of a society in which you are trying to do some gene editing enhancements therapy and stuff like that are somehow more deep and determine how the society is going to accept it and if it's going to accept it and it is going to accept it as something dangerous and apocalyptic or not. It's not just about the science because it's improving, it's about the society, how it can follow that and uh, somehow apply it or not for some specific issues and maybe that's the question, that's the answer to the question why in China people are more open. Maybe. We cannot say in China they they value life less. Maybe it's about the religion factor that people are not so <coughs> close to gene editing because they don't think there is a, a God that created everyone and everything. I think from the Christianity perspective, maybe that's why in Europe and America people are more close about. And it's not about the silicones and the Viagra. It's the stuff that are somehow more complex. Yeah, but religion is also a fact of time. 
religion also changes through time. You have examples where uh, when uh, there was stated the fact that uh, Earth goes around the sun, uh, many uh, bishops and uh, <coughs> church was against it, and then through the time it was accepted. And now anyone wouldn't complain about it. So uh, religion is also uh, a step of evolution. It also changes. So nobody can tell you how it uh, will work in uh, reality. It also depends on many factors how it will go. Mm. When, I, when I mentioned that the value of life in China is less than in some other countries, I mean uh, it in the following way. Not, no, no, not culturally. I mean it politically. Because in liberal societies, in liberal societies, the value of life is higher. For instance, in uh, uh, I don't know, in, in Germany or, or, or Holland or Sweden, I don't know, in state such a country, if a person disappears, that's a problem. So the police will be looking to find that person. In the Soviet Union, you had various plane crashes that were simply not publicized. So later it was find, found out, for instance, 10 years later, that there has been a plane crash. So the family of those people who were on the plane, because for political reasons, they don't, do not publish the fact that the plane has crashed on Soviet territory, their plane, the passenger plane. So the family of those people who were waiting on the airport, nothing. Everything, everyone uh, ought to shut up about that. So that's a typical example of a low value of life. Well, here in this country, for instance, you have, uh, 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 okay, in, in countries where, for instance, people are uh, uh, drive recklessly, you have, I mean, those, those of you who drive know that there are countries <laughs> who drove elsewhere, know, know, know that there are countries in which people are careful when they drive, very, and there are uh, countries where much more reckless driving is taking place. That's a symptom of uh, a lower value of life. If you're driving in a dangerous way, you obviously uh, value life less than if you are uh, if you behave uh, in a safe way uh, uh, behind the wheel. So that's what they meant with uh, a low value of life. So nothing cultural, merely. I thought also. Yeah. And also, you have North Korea where they uh, like executing people for watch Hollywood movie. Like, and there are also public executions. And that's something I agree with executing people who, who watch for Hollywood movies. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you that many questions that you have asked here, uh, we'll talk about them later for sure, <laughs> especially about uh, social problems, religious problems, and uh, unknown factors. <laughs> so we'll discuss it all. Okay, thank you for uh, for uh, uh, I'm only glad to see to see people. Uh, uh, I am the yeah, idea uh, to see people who uh, uh, are uh, are interested in these uh, in these things, and that's why we're doing that. So I try to provoke a, a, a discussion with my uh, with my comments. So the the tomorrow and the future be uh, as. Relax as possible. I would advise you to ask asking questions and so on. So just don't have any, don't feel any limitations and so everything. And speak, speak up uh, about this. So even if, if uh, people disagree on something, it's good to, to, to stimulate the discussion. That's why you're here. Uh, so, bravo, Pascal Bukai.
Mislim da nije još čekaj. Camera je still on. Gdje se ovo? Daj da okrenemo. Na ovo dokumentu. Ili ovo od sred. 